Hello. In this lecture, we are going to be talking about the Gospel of John. So at this point, we've talked about all the synoptic Gospels, and we will revisit Luke just a little bit when we go over Acts. But today, in this video, we are going to focus on the Gospel of John. So you're going to see when we look at the Gospel of John, again, look at the PowerPoints on your own, because I won't necessarily cover everything. You're going to see when we look at the Gospel of John that the Gospel of John is different. The synoptic Gospels all look the same. They have all of these similarities. They generally all take place in the Galilee area, um, ending, of course, in Jerusalem, but primarily taking place in the Galilee. Um, and they share a lot of similar things. Um, they also tend to have a generally similar timeline. There's a little bit of moving around of events. The order changes a little bit, but generally the order of the synoptics is the same. That is different with the Gospel of John. Not only is it in a different order, it has a generally different uh, geographic location. It mainly focuses on Jesus's ministry in Jerusalem. And not only that, it also tends to word things differently and has a whole lot of other differences. So as we go through this, just understand that the structure is different, the content is different. The Gospel of John is just different in a lot of ways. In fact, 90% of John is not paralleled in the synoptics. Now think about that. They're talking about the same person. The Gospel of John is a biography about Jesus. It's a gospel about Jesus. Um, not in the modern biography sense, but it, but it is a biography, essentially in the ancient sense, about Jesus. And so are the synoptics. Yet, they only share about 10% of similarity. They have some key stories that are similar, but the rest is very different. Now, this doesn't mean they contradict each other. It just means they have a very different focus, right? Like I said, the, the synoptics tend to focus on Jesus's ministry in the Galilee area, where John tends to focus on his ministry in Jerusalem, which means because they focus on different parts of his ministry, they tend to cover very different stories, although they do have about 10% overlap. So some of the big differences that you'll see in content is you won't see any parables um, in John. Very few parables here in John, all pretty much none. And then the focus is on the kingdom of God in the synoptics, but you don't have as much of a focus on the kingdom of God here in, here in John. Also, you see a lot of exorcisms there in the synoptics, but you don't really see that here in John. So just understand these differences because John is focusing on other things, right? He has a different focus. So let's talk about authorship. Who wrote it? Now, you might say, Dr. Brownie, of course, John wrote it. Look at the name, right? But of course, I agree with you, but I do have a question for you. Which John, right? We have several Johns. The two most famous being John as in John the Baptist, and we also have John the Apostle. But there are some other Johns that are mentioned, right? So John the Baptist, John the Apostle, or disciple, John Mark. You also have another John the Elder, which we'll talk about in a minute. And so John is just a common name. So which John are we talking about? Well, this is where external evidence is very, very helpful. Most important being a guy named Polycarp. Now, Polycarp is living um, around the time that we would call the time of the Apostolic Fathers. So these are the church fathers who were alive during the tail end of the apostles' lives or some part of the apostles' life. So we look at Polycarp. He was modern. He was martyred um, in Smyrna, which is in Asia Minor, around 156 AD. You can actually look up the martyrdom of Polycarp and read that. That's a very early source talking about his martyrdom. It's not hard to find. You could just Google it. 
and read that if you would like. Um, very early source about his life. Now, he died at about age 86, which means that he was born in 70 AD, which overlaps with the last 20 to 30 years of John's life, as far as we know from church history. So this is someone who lived at the same time. And according to church tradition, he was discipled by John himself. So John would have been quite old. John the Apostle, or disciple, would have been quite old and Polycarp quite young. So Eusebius relates that Irenaeus, all right, real quick, you probably read this in your um, PowerPoint beforehand, hopefully, maybe you didn't, but that even that phrase can be confusing. So before I read that to you, let me explain what we're talking about here. Eusebius is a famous church historian writing around the early 300s, okay? Very famous church historian, wrote something called the Ecclesiastical History, and we get a lot of really good information from Eusebius. He is a historian in a very traditional sense, ancient sense, and he really is trying to write a comprehensive history. And he includes a lot of traditions, and he uses sources. One of the sources that Eusebius uses when talking about this is a source from Irenaeus. Irenaeus said that he heard from Polycarp that John, the disciple, who leaned upon uh, Jesus' breast, wrote the gospel from Ephesus. So I, I want you to get to the level of security we have on this. This is, he said that he said that he said that this happened. Okay. So this is not the most reliable of sources. So we do need to keep that in mind. But it is the first real picture or window into uh, who wrote this. We have Eusebius, a historian, relaying from Irenaeus, a well-known church father, that he heard from Polycarp, someone who actually knew John, that John the apostle, disciple, is the one who leaned on Jesus' breast, if you look at the end of the Gospel of John, and who wrote the Gospel of John from Ephesus. Okay, Now that's a lot, but I do want you to grasp that that is probably one of the first examples, first clues about what we're dealing with here. Now, of course, we wish that we would have something written by Polycarp himself, or at least by Irenaeus, um, but the fact that we at least get it through Eusebius, who tends to be um, someone who is paying attention to sources, that is at least helpful. So continuing on on external sources here. So that sentence that we just discussed does give us a little information about the gospel. There are three things that it tells us. First, the author is John the Apostle. Now, again, very early on, you have that um, you have that uh, gospel according to John put at the very top of the gospel very early on. So church tradition had already pointed to it being John, but which John, right? So right here, what we see in um, what Polycarp says is that John the Apostle is the author. Second, John the Apostle is the one that's referred to as the beloved disciple. Now, you are supposed to be reading through the entire Gospel of John. Now, I know there's a lot of reading. You have textbook reading. You have other books of the Bible to read. But seriously, this is where you really get this, by immersing yourself in actually reading the Bible. So if you're reading the Gospel of John, you're going to notice that John never, never really refers to himself. In fact, and we'll talk about this in a minute, John is never mentioned. The Apostle John, who we know is present in Jesus's ministry from the uh, from Acts and from the Synoptic Gospels, he is never mentioned. Yet, there's this disciple that pops up over and over and over again, and it's the disciple whom Jesus loved. And that, key, that phrase keeps being used over and over and over again in the Gospel of John. 
So according to um, according to Polycarp, that person is John himself, because Polycarp says the per that John was the one that reclined on Jesus's breast. Well, we have this passage there at the end, there in the Last Supper, saying that the disciple whom Jesus loved leaned on his breast, really his chest, right? That's that's it's just their way of saying he leaned on his chest. OK, which, again, is not an unusual, uh, which is not an unusual thing. We tend to think of the Last Supper, them sitting at a table like Da Vinci style, like uh, Da Vinci's famous painting. But actually, often they would have actually reclined. It would have been much more of a laying down type of thing to eat their meals. They would have been laying down and they're often laying down um, in an overlapping way. So leaning on Jesus's chest is actually not, it's actually not as crazy as it might sound, okay? If we think of the ancient context of what that would have looked like, um, this was pretty typical. They actually reclined and laid down when they ate. That was how they ate. Um, so that's fairly typical. Okay, so third, the book was written from Ephesus. Now that's interesting as well, just because we look at Revelation and we start talking about Revelation and the authorship of Revelation, um, seeing that all these churches written, um, written to in the book of Revelation are written to around that area. And we also have tradition placing John around this general region. Now, continuing on with authorship. Um, we don't just have the stuff from Polycarp. We also see Clement and Tertullian attributing authorship to John the Disciple. So Clement of Alexandria, he's writing in the late second century. Um, Tertullian is also writing in the late second, early third century. So, and both writing in different places. Uh, Tertullian is writing from Carthage, which is uh, North Africa around what we would think of as Tunisia now. And Clement is writing from modern day Egypt, from Alexandria. So now we get Papias. And if you have been paying attention in all my other lectures, you know Papias is someone who comes up a lot and brings a lot of bombshells. So the problem with Papias is he's not always easy to understand. He's a little ambiguous. He's such an early source that we often get what Papias says because someone else quotes him. Um, we all, we don't really get him from his own work. So let's look at what Papias has to say. Um, some understand Papias as saying that there was another John. So basically Papias, he hints at there being another John called Elder John. And this Elder John is writing in Ephesus. So what many will say is that there are two, there are, there are two Johns that could be the author. One is John the Apostle and one is the Elder John. And that leaves some to say, well, how do you know that the Apostle John is the author? Again, we understand, yes, we see Papias says this, but it's very ambiguous the way it is said. It is not clear. And yet we have three other sources that unambiguously say that it was John the Apostle or disciple. So... Which do you take? Do you take the three clear pieces of evidence or the one ambiguous piece of evidence? The three clear, right? Now, let's talk about internal evidence. So again, we don't have a place where it says, I, John, wrote this book. But we do actually see a little bit of evidence, probably a little closer than the synoptic. So Let's let's start. Let's talk about this. So first of all, a guy named Leon Morris. He's a he's a commentator. At some point, when you do an exegesis paper, I'm sure you will come across some stuff that he has written. He argues that the internal evidence suggests that the author is Jewish. He looks at the writing. He looks at the writing style, the points that are made, the knowledge that this person had of Palestine, and he says that this person was a Jew. The person that wrote it was a Jew, probably from the area of Palestine, probably an eyewitness to the events, an apostle, and therefore John the Apostle. So that's the argument that he makes from internal evidence, right? So 
looking more in depth here at this internal evidence, let's, let's kind of see where this type of claim comes from. So first of all, the author claims to be an eyewitness. That's actually in chapter 1, verse 14, and chapter 19, verse 35. He claims to be an eyewitness. He claims to have seen these things, right? So it would be difficult to say, well, this is not really an eyewitness, and they're just lying. Well, okay. It's, it's hard to see that as being anything other than um, as any, as being anything other than a lie, right? Um, the people in the early church was very much aware of this. They were aware that people would try to lie. They were being very careful to make sure that John, uh, really was authentic. So I think we can take that the gospel of John is telling the truth. And according to it, um, he's an eyewitness. And again, this is something that we see affirmed by all of the church fathers around it, um, and Papias is unclear, right? So uh, the writer also seems to know a lot of names and a lot of vivid details. So this is information that seems to be consistent with somebody who was present. Also, they tend to know about Palestinian topography and geography, right? They tend to really understand the geography and the lay of the land when it comes to Palestine before AD 70. Now, if you've been paying attention, you know why this date of AD 70 is important. Because in AD 70, you have the culmination, the major, major point within the within the Jewish revolt. They started revolting around 66, and the temple is destroyed, and Jerusalem is invaded around 70. You have some mopping up operations for the next two to four years, but really the culmination is 70 AD. So you have to understand that the landscape changes. Jerusalem is destroyed. The temple is destroyed. Um, you have other cities that are taken over, that are destroyed, that are invaded. The landscape, the topography, the where things are is very much affected by this war, this four to eight year war. And yet, in spite of that, John seems to have a pretty good knowledge of this region before that. So again, that's evidence that it is written prior to 70 AD, or at least, at least written by a person who lived prior to 70 AD, right? Now, again, it could be John writing later on in life, but it still shows that it's written prior, that it's written by someone who knew what Jerusalem looked like around that period, what Palestine looked like around that period. All right, now, the author seems to know the finer points of Jewish interpretation as seen in Jesus's arguments about religious leaders, as well as about feasts. So what we see here is that there are certain arguments and views and thoughts about uh, Judaism that we know about through different books like Josephus, like, um, like the Mishnah, the Talmud, and other things. And John the writer of the Gospel of John seems to really understand these things. He seems to get it. He understands these concepts. And remember, he's not someone who can just Google uh, traditions about Palestinian feasts. No, this is something that you really need to be someone in the in-group to understand these things. And he does. He doesn't seem to be talking about these things as an outsider. So we see all this internal evidence. And we see a lot focusing on this idea of him being the disciple whom Jesus loved or the beloved disciple. So we get this idea. He appears at the Last Supper. He's reclining next to Jesus. Um, again, understand in these feasts, and you could probably actually find some pictures of this. In these feasts, they would be they would be reclining. They They would not be sitting in chairs like we sit. They tended to eat reclining. So when it says he was reclining at Jesus's chest, it, that just means that that's he was sitting like they normally do, but he was sitting at Jesus's chest level. Okay, so he was given care over Mary. 
And then also he races and beats Peter to the empty tomb. And then finally, we see this picture that the beloved disciple is the one that wrote the book. So we see all these things about the beloved disciple, and it comes down to the question, is John the beloved disciple? Who is the beloved disciple? Well, what we see is that of the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles, um, we see that John does seem to be the most likely of those there because there are seven disciples that are mentioned. Peter, James, and Nathaniel are also mentioned by name. And then also James is not mentioned. What's what's interesting is James is not mentioned. The, the apostle James is not mentioned, but it's probably not the apostle James because we know he dies around 44 AD. So that leaves us with one candidate who is not named and doesn't die early. And that's John. So we have external evidence pointing to John being the disciple whom Jesus loved. And the disciple whom Jesus loved being the writer. And then we have internal evidence being pointing to the fact that it might be John. So if John is not the beloved disciple, um, if John is not the beloved disciple, disciple he is never mentioned by name of the gospel, which seems unusual, right? So that does seem unusual. Again, James isn't mentioned, but again, James dies but too early. So John seems to be the person here, okay? Now, moving on, some difficulties here. If we're saying that this about the beloved disciple, some difficulties, is that a little prideful? Constantly saying, oh, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved. I'm the beloved disciple. Um, well, it's a little bit difficult. It's a, it could be seen as prideful, but it also could just as easily be seen as someone who is just amazed that God loves him this much. Just who is amazed that um, Jesus loves him this much. And you could argue that it actually shows some humility because he doesn't mention his own name. Instead of mentioning his name, he says this. So who is the we? Now, at the very end, if you read the Gospel of John, you, you'll see this community possibly that says, hey, you know, the disciple whom Jesus loved wrote this, and we're confirming that this is true. Who is the we? It just seems to be that there's some kind of community that influenced John. I'm assuming there seems to be some kind of community that was influenced by John and that just made sure that his book got published after he wrote it. So just understand that, again, I think we have really compelling evidence that we're talking about John here. So now let's talk about date. And that took us a long time to talk about John. It took us a long time to get through all that information, but let's talk about date now. In terms of date, um, I'll tell you, most people date it fairly late. This is one of the gospels that you'll hear pretty common you'll hear between 85 and 100 AD. And they'll just say, uh, John lived really long, right? So even to this day, you're going to see this dated pretty late, 85 to 100. But let's kind of talk about the overall history here. Let's kind of give you a general idea. There's this one guy called uh, J.A.T. Robinson. Honestly, this guy tends to date everything early. So Robinson... Um, he wrote a really well-known book, I think it was in like the 1970s, um, that basically argued that almost everything was written pre-70. And John was, you know, John had, I mean, Robinson had a really good argument for that, but there were a lot of holes in his argument. He tended to date everything early, and scholars have really questioned his work. Well, that's when I already mentioned this book to you in one of my other lectures, a guy named Jonathan Bernier, this is, he only did this in about 2022, late 2022. Um, he actually takes Robinson's arguments and he basically critiques those arguments and then puts his own effort in to build on those arguments. So he makes the same general argument that Robinson makes. All these books are before 70 AD, but he does it by adding extra evidence and using different evidence to it. 
So this statement is not 100% accurate anymore, um, but barely. Um, only in late 2022 has someone come out and actually also argued in favor of an early date. Bernier argues for about 60 to 70 AD being the authorship of the Gospel of John. But that's the exception. Robinson and Bernier are pretty much it. Um, even your most conservative scholars are still going to say 85 to 100. And I'll explain that a little more in the next slide. But let's talk about your skeptical scholars. Let's talk about those scholars that tend to date everything late. Um, every book that they can find, every book of the Bible, if they can date it to the second century, they will. Um, that is actually pretty common. Very critical scholars will do this. And this is actually really common with John. Uh, very often, if you look at the late 1800s, early 1900s, you had scholars that would often date this, um, the Gospel of John late. They would make all kinds of arguments. They would say it's more theologically mature. Um, it has all of these different views. Uh, it is the one that most unambiguously puts Jesus down as God. They think that must be late. So you have people very much pushing this late. One famous example is Rudolf Bultmann, who is a very famous scholar in the early 1900s. And he argued uh, just in a very strong manner that John was mid-second century. So much, much later than could have been written by John. He didn't think it was written by the Apostle John, thought it was written by someone later. But then in 1935, we discover something, and that is P52. That's Papyrus 52. And that is a small fragment of papyrus discovered in Egypt that has John written on it. And that papyrus is written, has, uh, is, date somewhere between 110 and 135 AD. Well, what does this mean? It means that you have, in a pretty good distance away, it was discovered in Egypt. So Egypt and Israel are not super close to each other, but they're somewhat similar. Um, they're not super close to each other. They got a little bit of distance. They're not worlds apart but remember we don't have cars and planes at this time so there's a bit of a distance there and then again likely john was written probably somewhere around ephesus so we're looking i mean we're looking even further away at this point and so we need to have john written early enough that it could be written copies could be made and they could be circulated and get all the way down to egypt so we're not talking it, written in 110, found in 110, right? This is something that, this is something probably that indicates that the Gospel of John was written much earlier, at least a decade to two to three decades earlier. So let's look at the fragment that we're talking about. Let's look at the size. It's about this size. It's about the size of a business card. You can see it there. And that really does point to an early date. Now, Again, when we look at this, that's a real good piece of evidence that it was written early. Now, this gets us to what a lot of scholars think now. When was the Gospel of John written? Well, a lot of scholars now, even conservative scholars, will put it between 85 and 100. And a big reason they do this is they say that it is so theologically mature that the later date makes more sense. Personally, I don't find that argument to be super compelling. Um, I think Mark is has a really strong uh, Christological theology. I think the fact that you see Jesus uh, speaking and nature obeying shows a deep Christology um, in Mark. So I, I don't quite find this to be super compelling, but you're going to find most of your commentaries are going to date John to 85 to 100, uh, probably around 85 to 90, and then dating... Uh, first, second, third John, uh, closer to 95 to 100. All right. So where was it written 
Again, Ephesus seems to be the main thing. I'm not going to go through all these different things, but most evidence points to Ephesus. I've already talked about that, so I'm not going to belabor the point here. So why was it written? Um, the purpose um, seems to be given because all these signs were done, all these things were done, and he's trying to tell you about Jesus, trying to tell you about the Son of God, right? And then also there seems to be an evangelistic point, trying to help people to understand. And specifically the Jews, there seems to be a focus on trying to convince the Jews to turn from, uh, well, actually to turn to Jesus as the rightful Messiah. It's very harsh. Uh, some very harsh language is used to refer to the Jews um, because you have this, like, you have this call to say, y'all have done this, turn towards Jesus. Um, so again, looking at uh, looking at what's going on, um, you have a lot of stuff happening around the time. If we're looking at 85 to 100, um, you're seeing some inter-community uh, fighting. You're seeing um, possibly, there's a little bit of dispute on this, but possibly that in the synagogues, the Jews have started banning Christians from their synagogues. Um, that is a, uh, a common view that that was happening and that they were incorporating uh, basically sayings that they prayed against uh, the Nazarenes or the Christians. So, and that was a prayer you had to pray when you come into the synagogue. So it's very common at this point to have Christians feeling like the Jews are kicking us out. And there's a, a greater separation between Jews and Christians. So that might be some of the division that is happening here. Now, again, I have an outline of John here. You can look at that and encourage you to look at that on your own, but I'm not going to go into it in depth right here. So features of John. One big feature is the use of signs. You have seven signs in John. So instead of having a bunch of little miracles, you have seven signs or miracles, um, and they each kind of have a, a very important function there in John. Um, John tends to have a very simple language. Um, if you're doing Greek, it's one of the first things that you'll translate because John has very simple language, um, both in Greek and when you look at it in English, even though it has a deep theology. Um, also, it emphasizes, as I've already said, it emphasizes Jesus' ministry in Judea and around Jerusalem, which is unique, uh, where the others emphasize it's uh, Jesus' ministry in the Galilee. Um, also, the focus on the deity of Christ is very strong, and a realized eschatology is just the idea of eternal life being very strong here. Now, let's talk really quick as we finish up. Let's talk about critical issues. You have a similar passage here in John as you do in the book of Mark. In the book of Mark, if you remember, the very last, like, 11 verses, um, our earliest manuscripts don't have them. Now, in John, we have a similar situation. We have probably one of the most famous stories in the Bible seems to not be original to the Gospel of John. Now, you're not going to want to hear this. I, I know that this is not going to be fun to hear, but if you've ever read your, read your Bible and paid attention to the footnotes, you'll notice that the story of the woman caught in adultery, the he who's without sin cast the first stone, that story, one of the best stories in the Bible, let's be honest, it's not original to John. Now, I know that's hard to hear because we love that story. But the reality is, is that in our ancient manuscripts, um, some manuscripts don't have it. Other manuscripts move it around. They put it earlier in John or they put it further back in John or they even put it in Luke. Right. So what's going on with this? Now, the problem is, is that it's a very early story. It seems to be a story that's quite early, that's extremely early. So some scholars have suggested, and, and, and honestly, I like this explanation, um, that have suggested that this is an authentic story of Jesus, 
that it is an authentic story of Jesus's life, but that it's not original to John. And you see early scribes having this true story about Jesus and trying to figure out where does it go. Um, but the sad reality is, is it's it's probably not original to John. It's not. I wish it was, but it's probably not. Now, is it still something that uh, seems to be an authentic story of Jesus? Many scholars say yes, some say no. Um, I tend to think it's an authentic story of Jesus. Uh, but, you know, to be honest, uh, there are many very smart people who don't think it's an authentic story of Jesus. And um, but we do know that it's not original to John. OK, it's very early. It's extremely early. And the scribes writing are really intent on trying to make sure that it's it's preserved. Um, but we don't know. Now, we're talking about this here because you're going to have church members ask you about this passage. You're just going to, right? You you might have more church members ask you about this passage than the Mark passage, because it's a great story. It's a great story. Again, um, unlike the Mark passage, where it very clearly seems to be someone taking a bunch of other passages and cobbling them together, um, this story just seems to be early scribes wanting to preserve this tradition, so figuring out where it best fits. So if you have any questions about that, I encourage you to ask you, to ask your professor for the class about that. And finally, um, abundant life is one of the key themes here that you focus on. So I hope you've enjoyed studying John. I hope you enjoyed reading John. It's a fantastic book of the Bible. It's a great book of the Bible if you want to introduce someone to Christ for the first time. So I hope you enjoy studying it, and I have enjoyed teaching it.